Gerard with space. Hopped in towards Barros. He's beaten Jack to it. The goalkeeper made contact. Luis Garcia wanted to break the line. Gallas hooked it away. Goal! The first goal of the semi final is a Liverpool goal. Welcome to another episode of the Front Free Podcast, where we talk all things football from the UK, Europe and South America. Today, I'm joined by my two co-hosts, Coach Dan and the birthday boy himself, AJ. AJ, happy birthday. How are you doing, mate? Thank you, my guy. Thank you, my guy. Listen, we thank God. It is grateful. Gratefulness that, that I have to give on to him. It's just pure gratitude, honestly. But now I'm really excited for today's episode. What a way to celebrate a birthday. That's right. I love with my two favourite guys. Come on. <laughs> and coach, I'm sure you're going to put him through his paces, aren't you? Always, always. Otherwise, <laughs> I wouldn't be doing my job. A big, a big shout out to you, AJ. A big happy birthday. Like we say in our culture, a year by now. Oh, yeah. A year by now. So... A, a year by now, what? I'm so confused. A year by now, you'd be <laughs> one year older. Man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about football, man. <laughs> A year by now, you'll be one year older. Maybe that's what I meant. <laughs> that's, I think that's what he meant. <laughs> um, I love that. But, but no, nah, absolutely, man. Enjoy your birthday, even in isolation and more blessings. Amen, amen. Amen. All right, let's kick off today's episode with the biggest game so far since the coronavirus. The Bayern Munich and Dortmund played out played a game yesterday and it ended 1-0 to Bayern Munich. So Joshua Kimmich's wonderful chip, um, about 20 yards out, a few minutes before halftime, settled the game and saw Bayern Munich go seven points clear at the top of the table. So guys, is this the sit for the league? Has Bayern, have Bayern won it now, do you think? Yeah, man. I think we mentioned it last week that it was a must-win game for Dortmund. It was mm-hmm. a must-win game. And I think Bayern, I think the league's Bayern's now. Leipzig are too far behind. And I feel like truly Dortmund were their biggest challenges if we looked at, like, you know, it be mathematically possible if they won yesterday. But unfortunately, they fell they felt short, man. I was so disappointed, man, honestly. Mm. Real disappointed. I was going to say, I would have to agree with AJ there. I think it's theirs to lose now. And I don't see the other teams closing the gap. You see, right now, it's just their mind is solely on... on preparing for, for the Bundesliga. So, mm. it'll be tough. It'll be tough. They seem to have, you know, the depth and quality as well. So, unless unless something <laughs> dramatic happens, they would have to, the, the rest of the league would have to wait for next year to see if they can have another go at it. I mean, Dortmund, they started off really well. I mean, they almost scored in the uh, first few seconds when the ball was cleared over the line. But, um, as the game wore on, uh, Bayern Munich, they got into the game. They created chances of their own. And even after they scored uh, the first goal just before half time, and then even after half time, Dortmund really didn't look like they were threatening. So, I mean, are we slightly disappointed with Dortmund? I mean, they were at home. I mean, there's no fans, but are we a little bit disappointed with how the game turned out for Dortmund? Yeah, I think, you know, for the first 25 minutes, Dortmund were unreal. They were moving the ball with zip. There was a tempo to their play. You know, in the final third, it was intricate, but they were lacking that cutting edge. Haaland, he was isolated a lot. And when he did get chances, he was he was well marshaled by the Bayern defence, I must say. Especially Alfonso Davis and Alaba. They were stalwarts yesterday. I think in the first 25 minutes, Dortmund, the tempo was fantastic. The pressure on the ball was great. The build-up was great, but it was just in that final third, they were lacking that killer instinct. And, you know, as they say in football, when you're on top, if you don't punish, you mm. will get punished. And you've got to remember, Bayern have been, been doing this. They're experienced. They are champions. So as the game grew on and Bayern started to, you know, start to get to the grips with the, the tempo of the game and, you know, Kimmich started to dictate a bit more and, you know, Muller started getting on the ball a bit more. And, um, you know, it was, it, was, it, was, it was a fascinating game for the first half an hour. And then obviously Kimmich just scored that audacious, do you want some salt with them chips? <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and then you could see that, you know, Dortmund were deflated. And that's, and that's where, you know, the, the, we needed the experienced ones to stand up. And to be fair, um, Hummels and Plisek, they, they were unbelievable yesterday. Mm. And I feel like they were just let down a bit. 
by the final third. You know, I think once the goal went in half time, I think Dortmund got a bollock in, <laughs> if yeah, I can 100%. say that. <laughs> but then I think Bayern got a rocket. <laughs> <laughs> Bayern came out second half and they were absolutely dominant. Every yeah. department. They, yeah. they they looked like champions that second half. They they were playing, it was it was their game. And I feel and for so them because play. as well that, you know, they, I mean, a draw was good for them. So once they went 1-0 down, they could they could just like sat back and just hit them on the counter-attack. Yeah, I know, but they didn't, you know, and they mm. made some very good substitutions. I was very, um, it was a bit peculiar, the changes that the Dortmund boss made to take off Brandt, who had been their best player, to bring on Sancho and Emre Chan came on as well. I feel like Brandt shouldn't have come on, come off, to be fair. I think he was, he was probably their best player attacking-wise. So for him to sub him off, I don't know if he was injured or whatnot, but that was peculiar. And then, yeah, then, you know, Bayern started flexing their, their power. And, you know, when you've got the likes of, you know, Perisic to come on off the bench and, you know, when you've got that type of arsenal, do you know what I mean? You can, you can do a lot on the football pitch. And, yeah, they grew into the game. They definitely grew into the game. And then once they had a hold of the game, they, they, looked, they looked threatening every, every chance they had. You know, they looked like they were going to score, especially in the second half. I think Lewandowski hit the post late on. He had a few chances, but honestly, the Dortmund defence will be very disappointed because I felt like they marshalled Bayern very well. The two centre-halves did very well against Lewandowski. He wasn't getting a sniff. You know, the full-backs were doing well. It's just the midfield and up front, there, there, was, there, was, there was no cutting edge, unfortunately, for Dortmund. And I think that's their, their, their title hopes done. Vanquished. Mm. Benito. Yeah, for sure. AJ, AJ's covered a big chunk of that. I, I agree. I, I was a bit perplexed to why he made two substitutions at half time just like that. Um we've taken off Julian Brandt. And and I think in a way I'm I won't even I I wouldn't say I'm disappointed. I think I think to have kept the score down even to to um one nil, I think that was a great job done by them. Of course they would have wanted to have done more, but the last few games Dortmund has been doing mopping the floor with with um Borussia Dortmund. So this was quite a big gap that they closed. It was just very unfortunate because the attacking, the attacking force is quite young mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Bayern had the experience. That's a yeah. difference, I think. Right yeah. now. He's building a team around youth, this Dortmund guy. So time and experience will get them there. But Dortmund, like AJ hey, said, they've been doing this. <laughs> and they, they, they showed why they, they're champions once again on, on well, yesterday. So all the credit to them because it's one thing you know when you know how to do the job but sometimes getting it done mm. it's, it's a tough job but Bayern stuck to it they stuck to it I would say though I thought that goal was a was a chip cross I don't know if he went for <laughs> golf but let me nah he went for golf he went for golf he definitely went for golf well if 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 um, the, um, our brother agrees with you then you guys will win but to me <laughs> it was just a bit bizarre. I feel like, nah, he's not that cheeky. But no, but he is though. The thing is with Kimmich them. is he's highly regarded. I think Pep spoke up highly of him. You know how he's one of the best players he's ever worked with. He's got that intelligence. He's very bright. Like so, he didn't even look at that. Nah, def- oh, woo! I need to watch it again. <laughs> Great chip. Well, but the keeper. Definitely... Yeah, go on. <laughs> keeper should have saved it, guys. Let's be honest. He got a whole glove to it, and it still went in the net. I was so. <laughs> I was... <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> <laughs> uh, but just going back to Dortmund, uh, coach, you said that you know they're young and it'll take them time. But I mean, over the last two transfer windows, they spent like 130 million pounds. I mean, you know, I mean, you can talk about how inflated prices are for players at the moment. But I mean, that's a lot of money to spend and to come short once again. I mean, last year they were close. This year they're not going to win it. It seems. I mean, yes, we're saying give them time and whatnot. But do you think the manager should be under pressure? I, well, I mean, in a sense, because he, I, I would assume he's the one that gave the go-ahead to, to acquire those kinds of players. Mm. But then again, I wouldn't think so. I don't know if there's anyone out there that would do a better job than he's doing. He's doing mm. really good, if I'm mm-hmm. honest. Mm. He's doing really good with that team. I think, I think you know, when Ritzel isn't playing, they miss, they miss his creativity yesterday and his ability to keep the ball moving for them. Delaney done a good job, but then he came off, so it could have been something to do with fitness. Um, but you got... Uh, look, you take, someone like, you take someone like Sancho, right? For the last two years or so, he's been doing madness. But then you have, like, what's his name? Kinsley Coleman, 
he's been winning leagues for the last four, five years or so. You, yeah. you, you, it wouldn't, you wouldn't even think the guy's that young because he's mm. been around. It looks like he's been around. He's played for Juventus, um, PSG, now, now Bayern. And he wins mm. his titles wherever he goes. And he's, he's probably the same age as Hazard. And so it, it shows you the difference. The experience is very vast. And I don't even think Coleman was, was all that yesterday, but I'll just join that comparison. So, so time, time would have to be given. I mean, I think, I think they've got a lot of potential. I know Hakimi is not their player, but he's got great potential. for the for, for, what a player he is, by the way. Indeed. The amount of time I've seen him, yeah, I'm even, I'm even starting to tilt towards him more than Hector Bellerin. I feel like I feel like Hakimi is a good, good, good potential. Though. I think he's better than Hector Bellerin. I would I wouldn't argue with it. I wouldn't argue with it. If I'm he's honest, he's better in the final third. His delivery is better. His decision making is better. No, honestly, and, I'd, I'd, I'd go on a limb and say that. To be sure, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't even argue with that as well. It's funny though, just to say yesterday when I was watching the game, I go, I go, oh, Hakimi is doing really good, man. I'm very impressed. The moment I said that, he started making misplaced passes. He wasn't doing as good as and I was like. <laughs> I jinxed him, man. I jinxed yeah. him. I jinxed him. But they, they got potential. I, I thought Julian Brandt is, he's very bright. I've always liked him, even at Bayer Leverkusen. Um, yeah. Haaland, we all know what he can do and what he's been doing. Yeah. And and let's see. Let's see. Hopefully they don't let Bayern steal their players as they always do mm. and let them build and actually give them a challenge because right now Bayern is just walking everything right now. Yeah. I think... I think, like you said, it'll be very interesting who they can hold on to in the in the transfer window. You know, there's talks of Sanchez going, them Sancho going, sorry. You know, there's talks of, you know, um, Hakimi might be getting sold. You know, they're releasing Gose. So, you know, again, like you said, they're a young team. They do need time. But also, you know, football is <laughs> it's a, it's a results-based game, man. You can't be spending 130 mil and, you know, mm-hmm. not be winning the title. But, you know, of course, buying our experience, and like you said, you know, players like Coleman, Kimmich, they're young, they're fit, but they're about, and they've won things, you know what I mean? And you can't teach that winning mentality, that experience that comes with that level of winning. Mm. And, you know, Alaba, for example, I think he's 29, 30 now. You know, he's been around for years. He's still relatively in his prime now, and he has won things. He's experienced. So even the younger players around him, like, you know, Alfonso Davis, and, you know, they will grow in confidence, and, and they will grow with that mentality as well because of who they have around them. You know, when we look in the Dortmund ranks, you know, Hummels, you know, apart from Hummels, really, do we have, do we have a serial winner amongst them? You know, do we, ah, these are questions, you know, we can yeah. pose here and there. Yeah, I think my only thing is that, um, yes, they're young and during time they'll get better. But I think my thing is that once you have the players now, I mean, it's the best chance to make use of it because in a few years' time, who knows what could happen. Bayern could get better. RB Leipzig as well as coming up as well. So, mm. I mean, while you've got the time and the talent, I mean, you've got to make use of it. So, um, we'll see what happens later on with Dortmund. But uh, just moving on to our next topic. So, this week, the Huddersfield owner has come out and said, or warned, sorry, that 50 or 60 clubs could go bust unless the game, the football game, starts to plan for the financial impact of COVID-19 beyond the 2019-2020 season. So, well, you know, he's come out and he's made such a profound statement and I don't think he's wrong in what he's saying. We all know the financial implications Auntie Rona has come and, and, you know, bestowed upon a lot of the lower league clubs and what we got to understand is, like we spoke about a few weeks ago, I think, you know, the financial aspect of football is is normally kind of overlooked Mm. because we look at the game and the managers and the players. But, you know, we've got to remember it's a business. And, mm-hmm. you know, he is right. There are about 50 or 60 clubs who could go into administration, who could go bust. And it could be the end of some very good clubs and some very well-established clubs. But because of the financial strains that have now been put on them, you know, they're going to... They, they, it's either they, you know, they completely begin again and scratch everything and let go of all the top players, trim their wage bill and, you know, start to rebuild from the lower leagues or they go into administration. Mm-hmm. And it's a sad thing. And, you know, honestly, at 50 to 60 is a huge figure, I think. You know, there'll be investments here and there, so that, that number will drop significantly. But let's not be surprised when we hear of Team Kennedy's administration because of all that's happening. Yeah, and quite a lot of teams already, off, um, even before coronavirus, were on the edge of administration as yeah. well. So, I mean, this just tips them over the edge. Exactly. They were struggling as it is, and then, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then this comes through that, you know, 
we got to remember a lot of a lot of investments that go into the clubs. You know, they they see the revenue they see comes from you know selling tickets, social media campaigns, shirt mm. sales. You know, all those things would have dried up in this season. All those things would have dried up in this season. So it's 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 you know, should the Premier League step in and help them? Mm. Well, with the amount of money that the Premier League has, you know, uh, it's a good argument that they should. They should. They should step in and help these teams because at the end of the day, these teams are, you know, they're, you know, the grassroots teams. These are the teams that are still building the profile of English football as a whole. It's a collective thing. So I feel like the Premier League should intervene, but then un- un- under what parameters, you know, these mm. are all questions, you know, we can't answer here, but they're things that we should definitely be discussing. Yeah, I mean, he said that across the league, I mean, across the leagues, like from Premier League all the way to the lower leagues, he's saying that players should take a 30 to 40% wage cut I mean for the top players I don't know how how they'll feel about that but I think that's one of the main solutions to be honest that's a tough one though because you know it, as a player you're looking at it like you know look let's say you for example you I don't know um, Bernardo Silva right mm-hmm. let's say that like, and you know if you're, you're looking at your career you've come back into training you're risking your life you're earning your wage and all of a sudden you're hit you're hearing you know, you're going to take a 30, 40% pay cut for, for I don't know, <laughs> I don't know, let's, what team can I mention? Maidenhead, you know, he's probably never heard of them. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So mm. it's also, it's also, you know, you've also got to think about that aspect of things. You've also got to think, this is someone's livelihood being cut to provide mm-hmm. for, for someone else's livelihood. It, it, these are, I don't know, personally, I don't know how I'd feel about that. Yeah. Coach? Right, I mean... I think the options sort of um, you guys have provided, those, those are meaningful um, options and everything like that. But I think they've even got to look at it yeah, in a long-term sort of strategy. And I've, for a long time, I've been thinking this. Someone, as someone that loves football, right? Mm-hmm. I've been thinking this. And I'll just, I just sometimes look at certain individuals and the amount of money they're earning and stuff. And I'm thinking, ah, oh, this is ridiculous. I think what... I think football worldwide needs to come here with a criteria 100%. of pay, a criteria of pay to protect mm. clubs. Like a salary got, cap, sort of. Exactly. They have to. They shouldn't have a player yeah, just coming from under, under 23s or whatever, comes into the first team and starts demanding because their, their agent is a good agent and stuff mm. like that. I think <laughs> the, the football, the football, um, the football committee have to come up with some sort of a pay a pay cut like like you mentioned. I think it will do it will do well for 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 you know the future of football in general because they can't keep spending money like this. These little clubs, right? Let's just take a little club, right? And assume they sell I don't know a hot dog for six pounds, right? Or even mm-hmm. five pounds, yeah. And you times that, let's say, by twenty thousand funds mm-hmm. or twenty eight thousand funds. That's that money alone can pay for the wages of their players. Yeah. But they're weak. You see what I mean? And so not having funds is a big problem. Mm-hmm. And that carries on and they still go pay these players. They can't survive. Mm. They can't survive. You see what I mean? But then again, I, w- I wouldn't think yeah, it would be fair for them to ask these players take pay cuts. Because unlike, un- unlike like the, fur- um, the furlough system, right, where you get 80%, but then your, your employees can't ask you to work. We all know exactly. these people have been working behind closed door. You see what I'm saying? And they will be sent things, fitness um, schedules to, to, to follow and abide with with their diets and stuff like that. So if, if they're still having to keep themselves going, then perhaps you shouldn't ask for pay, pay cuts. Although, even if they go for the pay cuts, a lot of these footballers will survive. Yeah. Everyone but, in the premiership will survive. Cause, yeah. Go on, go on, jump on. No, I was just going to say that, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit ironic call it, calling for players to take pay cuts now when they, to be honest, the, wage, the wages has gone up and up and up. I feel like this was bound to happen at some point where, you know, the whole thing goes bust and I feel like something should have been done earlier on to cap players' mm-hmm. wages. I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. I think they need to, they need to Im- implement something like that. And I think I was reading some, some article in the week well, I read the title and I think um, the UEFA, I don't know, president or someone that works in there was, was suggesting the same thing. I think he'll be good. I think players should be, should be paid based on sort of um, the importance for a national team or their influence within the game and stuff like that. So, of course, Messi, Ronaldo's, yeah, there, there won't be much difference in sort of what they're earning because they do a lot for the game, right? 
But then mm-hmm. there's some players that are on 35k a week, and you're thinking, that's that's quite a lot. Yeah, that's quite a lot. I know Chelsea are quite, you know, they they're one of the victims or yeah, the suspects when it comes to paying high wages for for youngsters and stuff like that. And mm-hmm. I think that in a way also affects players in taking taking their sport serious because. If you're a young kid at the age of 19 that has never played first-team football, right, you're playing reserves football, whatever you want to call it, and you're pushing in 20K a week, you're making a living. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So you're not really being pushed to to want to make it first-team, although a lot of them want to. Of course, that's the dream you want to play. But as long as you're making a living, you're cool. And I don't see how that's helpful. That's helpful. Like, like you take you take the wage bill, right, of... of very average players, for one thing, and also players that don't play that often, and you compare them to, like, um, Atletico Bilbao, who's in Spain, yeah? I remember when in um, Ica Munayin or whatever, I think a few years back, and I saw his wage compared to some Chelsea under-21 under, <laughs> under 21 players, and I was thinking, this is ridiculous. This guy's playing Europa, playing against United, doing bits, yeah? And you've got someone playing reserves football, earning more than him. You see what I mean? But then who's progressing more as a player? The guy that's playing. Although the money he's earning isn't that much. It keeps him humble because then he knows he needs to actually get to a certain level in order for the top, top cash to come in. So it, it will help. It will help if they can implement something like that. Just to say football. Because it's a serious thing for someone to come out and say that. That's, that's, you shouldn't take that lightly. That's an owner that's saying that. He knows what mm, the financial situation is. The finances, is yeah, like yeah. Exactly. And for him to say, you know, they need to take a 30 to 50% pay cut. Mm. I know, and he knew he'd get backlash from what he's saying, but he's saying it because he understands the diet. That that's, that's the reality, the isn't it? The, the reality of what's really going down and what's really going to go down. So it's, it's, it's a fascinating one, honestly, guys. It's a fascinating one. Yeah, it's quite interesting because at the moment, the talk has been like for the past three or four weeks, when are, the, when are the clubs going to return on the pitch? When is Premier League going to come back? When is League One coming back? But that's very short-term thinking. If you think about the long term, they're saying that, you know, unless a vaccine is, fa- a vaccine is found, there'll be, no fans be- there'll be no fans in the stadium until that time. So, I mean, that's a dire situation for a lot of lower league clubs. So, I mean, they really need to think about the long-term strategy, not just for the Premier League, but for um, English football as a whole. Mm. And also, that, like, even, even, and that's exactly it. You know, it's not just about the Prem. Do you know what I mean? It's mm. English football as a whole. I think the National League chiefs, they, they, they met and they don't know whether to, you know, restart the National League. They've asked for an extension for when they can decide. You know, all these leagues, you know, they're all struggling. They're all trying to find the means and ways to, to enable things to work. And like you said, a lot of the attention has been on the Prem and when's the Prem coming back. But yo, it's not just about the Prem. It's the bigger picture. It is yeah. English football as a whole. You know, it's not just the Prem that has suffered. It is football from a whole. It's from the Prem all the way through to step six, all the way through to Sunday League. You know, we can't forget these things. Mm. So, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it is a tough one right now. Definitely. Okay, so moving on to our next topic, we're going to look at South American football and the Brazilian league in particular. So, I mean, this happened a few weeks ago, but I just wanted to touch on it in light of what we were talking about last week. So, 12 high-profile Brazilian players issued a video statement a couple of weeks ago as a a sign of unity, you know, saying that um, we need to think of everyone's health and football is not as important at this current moment, especially given how bad the situation is in Brazil. Do we think, why do we think the Premier League players didn't do it or other players around Europe didn't do it, whereas they're doing it in Brazil? <laughs> it's an interesting one. I think maybe in Brazil, they understand <laughs> the significance of what will happen. You know, they look at their surroundings, they look at if there was to be a massive outbreak in Brazil. And I think in Brazil, they haven't hit their peak, I believe I'm hearing as well. Mm. So imagine, imagine what could happen, the scenes that could happen if that... Could you imagine the amount of death, the death tolls? So I think in Brazil, the players are just looking at it. Look, lives come before sport. Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. why they came up and made that and, and done that and made that statement. And I've got to respect. I've got to respect them. I honestly have to hold my hands up and respect them for doing so. Because I know certain clubs want want Brazilian football to you know come back into play. They want the top league to start playing again. But mm. some of the players rightly come out and you know they've they've made their voice known. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. They've made their voice known, and I respect that one hundred percent. Mm. Yeah, I would have to agree. I think 
I think is a great respect to them. If if top players feels that way, then whoever is in charge of the Brazilian leagues and stuff like that are going to have to listen. Because these players, if they have a voice, if they're not going to go training like we have Chodini say, a lot of people are not going to come training. Mm-hmm. And and then again, if if the you know the the league um, organizers were to go against that and death does happen or any severe sickness and such, they will have a lot of questions that they won't be ready to answer. So mm. so yeah, they they need to listen to them. I know I know Solar like reading and bits and bit, bits and stuff from here and there that the Brazilian nation is sort of um, experiencing their, their, their um, crisis in the, in, the, in the sense of corona. So mm-hmm. they need to be mindful of that. They need to be mindful of that. The economic structure, be, you know, here in Europe and Brazil is very different. We complain here, you know, that the UK government might have not, they haven't done good, but they were quite, they did quite okay, you know, getting people indoor and offering money and stuff like that, you see? Mm. Brazil, I don't imagine it has the economic structure to afford furloughing uh, the, the, the nation to, <laughs> yeah. to give them money. So it would, they would have still been having people go to work and live life normally. But now mm. that it's hitting them, you know, they shouldn't, like, like fo- footballers shouldn't be scapegoats. If they want to stop, they should stop. I think, I think they'll be coming to pre-season now, as it is anyway. So mm-hmm. if they can do sort of um, isolation training and work in their fitness and maybe delay the league for a, a while longer, then that's what they're going to do. But if, if there's been a, commu- a committee as such raising their concerns, they must be listened to. Yeah, but uh, someone made an interesting point because of these 12 players, I mean, these were 12 high-profile players. But the thing about the Brazilian league is like there's quite a big disparity in terms of the pay. So the big stars obviously get the most amount of money, but, you know, those who aren't as good don't get paid as much so for them they're thinking well it's rich you guys earn so much money so you guys can come out and say that but for us you know we might not be earning as much so maybe we want to go to play we want to go and play you know no matter what's happening out there with the virus that's true you know you know every player's contract is different so for example you know for for those who are on a basic very good way like the top players for example compared to you know someone who plays for like a a lower end of the table team who, you know, gets a bonus of like maybe what, two grand every time he steps foot on a pitch or is including the squad. He needs that bonus because his basic wage could be, it could be peanuts. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So of course, so I I believe there are players who who, will be feeling like that. But then I believe those players will also think about it, you know, you know, you know, they'll think about it with a bit of logic and understand, you know, if the the coronavirus had a huge outbreak in Brazil, they would suffer. The, the nation would really suffer. The, the people living in favelas would suffer. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, no country wants to go through um, an outbreak like, you know, the way China did or even we did or even Spain did. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I think there's two, there's two sides to that coin. Mm-hmm. But I think at the end of the day, look, as long as you're on a contract and you've got money coming in, <laughs> I think people will be grateful, man. Honestly. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Definitely. So we'll see what happens there. Okay, so the final topic for this section of the podcast. Um, so Michael Balek came out this week and said that Virgil van Dijk only shines because of the quality, sorry, the quality of the Premier League's forwards is poor. So he says, um, van, Virgil van Dijk is very lucky to play in an era where there's no Drogba, Frank Lampard, Alan Shearer, Henri, Wayne Rooney, Robin Van Persie, Carlos Tevez, Emmanuel Adeboyo, and Diego Costa. Uh, what, what do you think of his comments? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Michael Ballack, you know. It's a point well made. It's a point it well is. made. It is. It's a point well made. And you know what made. I was going to say? You know what I was going to say? Let's not bring in the Champions League just yet. Let's genuinely actually look at the top strikers in the league. Mm. And let's see if we can name. 10 world-class strikers from the Premier League. Impossible. Impossible. <laughs> no point. No. Zero points. No. So he makes a very, very good point. <laughs> I mean, I mean, look, let's, let's call a spade a spade. Let's be real. The quality of the Premier League strikers at the moment, and I think for the last few years, to be honest, has not been what it was. Mm-mm. You know, we no longer have the Fernando Torres. We no longer have the Drogba's, the Diego Costa's. You know, 
I think the one striker who's that I could maybe name two or three world class strikers from the Prem. Mm, I think you would put the Liverpool front three in there, wouldn't you? But I mean, he doesn't get to play against them, so. <laughs> well, you, well, exactly. Yeah, he doesn't get to play against them. He plays against them in training. Training, yeah. And they, prob- and they probably they probably rip them apart. You know, the world class tracks in the Prem. If, if I'm going to be honest, it's Aguero, it's Harry Kane, mm-hmm. and probably Aubameyang. Well, I would say definitely Aubameyang as well. Um, yeah, those are the three world class strikers in the Prem. Yeah, yeah, and, I'll, I'll agree with that. And between them and the next batch of strikers, there's no comparison. No. Yeah, I'll so agree with that. Like makes a, he makes a very good point, man. <laughs> I love people actually slated him for saying that, but if no, you no, just but look I, at it on paper, it's, I mean, he's correct. No, no, no. You know what? Yeah, I agree with the statement that we don't have the top quality strikers like he mentioned. Like, listen, there, there's not going to be a Thierry Henry and an Alan Shearer or Van Persie or Wayne Rooney coming along anytime soon. Mm-hmm. But that's not to take away from Van Dijk's quality. I'm course, sorry. Yeah. I, I agree with that part of the statement, yeah? Mm. But you can only beat what's in front of you. And he mm-hmm. does it looking very good. And not only that, like, he's not only showing them, like, his... Def- if you even look at it, right, as good as he is as a defender, yeah, is the, pa- the other part of his game that he's able to implement that makes him such a good defender. Look, I had to, yeah, really think about it carefully when Vincent Company, Vincent Company himself mm. says he feels Virgil van Dijk is the best defender to ever play in mm. the premiership. That is a statement in itself. Because look here, yeah, you have players, when they achieve good stuff like Vince and company did, yeah, they come with ego and they will never accept any such thing. Yeah. But he said it himself, and this was a guy that competed against some of the top defenders in his time. You see what I'm saying? He had John Terry's and them lot players. Mm. The, the Carrigers, the Koshoni. I thought Koshoni in his prime, I thought he was decent. He had Vidic and them lot. So that's a big statement for him to have It made. is a big statement for him it's to a say. a big statement. But yeah. I mean, I, would, I don't know about the best ever in the Premiership, but he won't be far from it. I think Vir- Virgil van Dijk is very good. He, I, I think he's a great he's player. Good. Yeah, yeah, for sure. for sure. I agree with you, coach. I think the thing is with van Dijk as well, he's remodelled what being a centre-half is. As a game has developed, you know, what a centre-half is, you know, centre-halves are now adding a bit more, you know, the ability to stride forward with a pass, the ability to pass between the lines, the vision, you know. So... In terms of him, him, I think by the time he finishes his career in England, he'll go down as one of the best centre-backs we've ever had. Again, I need him to win a couple of trophies, you know, and to solidify that. But honestly, he's a, he's, he's a very special player. One thing I do want to say, which I agree with you as always, you know, he does it week in and week out. Let's look at Neymar, for example. When Neymar played in Brazil, yeah, that was mad, mad debates. Is he really good? He's not that good. He's playing against kids, farmers, the the the. the I always said this point, his numbers don't lie and he does it week in and week out. And he's come to Europe and what has he done? He's maintained them levels. So, you know, it doesn't matter who you're playing up against. If you're good, you're good. Do you know what I mean? And Van Dijk is very, very good. However, what Van Dijk is true though, the strikers, the level of strikers in the English league is, is dead, man. But I think it's <laughs> a more, like his you. statement is more of an indictment of the level of strikers that we have in the Premier League at the moment. Yeah, yeah. I think it's more yeah. to do with that than the quality of Van Dijk because, I mean, right. I think if he played in any any era, I think he'll be a top quality defender no matter who he came up against. Exactly. That's why I agree with the first part of his statement or the second part, whichever it is that was claiming, you know, we don't have, <laughs> yeah, that we don't have top, top strikers. Yeah. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. I mean, the teams, the teams themselves haven't been that much of a challenge anyway, apart from apart from Manchester City for the last two, three years for Liverpool. So mm. his point is well made. But I think it's even more to do with the indictment of, of teams that are coming up against Liverpool. Because yeah. the front three of Manchester City's front three are just running the show. And it's mm. funny because like, we, we have to be very careful with like, these classifications of like, world class and stuff like that. There's some players that are very good, but I won't mm-hmm. put them in world class because world class <laughs> requires different type of, different type of quality because... If you would put, yeah, let's say Messi and Ronaldo in a world class category, there mm. should be no one else in that category. No, but they're, 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 they're on a different planet. They're, they're, mm-hmm. okay. They're, they're okay, so legends, that's their category, mate. yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's, their they've got their own category, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, they're in a different world. All right, I don't, I don't call Messi and Ronaldo world class. I say that they're, they're in a different realm. Mm. They operate on a different <laughs> level. You know, but I'll call players like 
Kylian Mbappe world class. Do you know what I mean? Because he I wouldn't, is... I wouldn't argue with that. I wouldn't argue with that. Oh, he yeah. is world class, you know. I'd, genuinely, I'd call Sergio Aguero world class. Do you know what I mean? So, these are players who I count as world class because, you know, they're at the top level of their game, you know, and they know how to produce week in and week out, mm. you know. So, Messi and Ronaldo, different category of fish, mate. Different kettle of fish, mate. Different yeah. kettle of fish. <laughs> <laughs> and I, but I think it's also a testament to the fact that if you look at the Premier League over the years, I mean, they've been blessed with very, very top-class strikers, if you think about it. Yeah, and, and that's why it makes what Balak is saying very true. You know, there has been, there has been a very steep decline of the, 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 the type of strikers that Prem, the Prem has had and what we do have now. You know, we're talking about the Nicholas and Nelkers, you know. If we want to pull back, I'm talking about, you know, Robbie Fowler, Emil Heskey, you know. Those strikers, you know, who guarantee you goals week in and week out. Those strikers who had a bit about them. You know, Drogba, for example. Fernando Torres, when he was at Liverpool, was unbelievable. Like, mm-hmm. come on, guys. These, these, are, these are seasoned strikers. Strikers who know where they're back in the net. And strikers who will win you games all by themselves. Whereas these days, I don't... I, I, well, right now in the Premier League, you know, there's only three that I can name who I believe can do that. And I named them earlier. So, yeah, from what we've seen to what we have now... Yeah, we're lacking. We're lacking in that department. We're lacking in that department heavily, heavily. You know, especially when people like Lewandowski is pulling up trees in Germany. You know, Luis Suarez before he was injured at, at Barca, pulling up trees. But I think if we look at strikers as a whole, like football holistically, the level of strikers has dropped somewhat. Strong, and, I strongly agree with that. I strongly I agree with that. Yeah. Look, there was, a, there was a point in time when United had Tevez, Berbatov, when Rooney <laughs> and, and I think Ronaldo for a Ronaldo, while as well there. Yeah. Listen, mm. <laughs> no team has that anymore. Even, uh, yeah, yeah I, well, apart from Liverpool, I'm talking about in the Premiership anyway. Like Manchester, you look at Manchester City, yeah, they really only have Aguero and if, Jesus, that's yeah. it. The rest yeah. are just wingers that are able to attack and stuff. Like, you know, mm-hmm. like Mo Salah, although he might call himself a winger, yeah, his level of finishing is that of a top striker. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? And so, mm-hmm. and so this, that luxury of you're completely right is gone now. They talk about they talk about um, Lacazette being a top striker as well and Aubameyang, but Lacazette's numbers don't really impress me. No, His numbers no they don't, don't impress me. For, for, for me to call him a world class or a top striker, they don't impress me. Like now, we find a striker that scores ten goals or more, or te- between ten to fifteen goals, we, we call them excellent in the Premiership. I'm thinking <laughs> defending defending has gone out the window now, so we should be getting more goals than we have been doing. But these strikers that we're paying 18 million for certain strikers at Watford that can't even they couldn't even they couldn't even oh mate, I don't know, man. So <laughs> I don't I don't I, yeah, the striking department. And I think you're right, worldwide is missing. Worldwide. Like that's yeah. why it's like Nibramovic is nah, still I, do you remember when we had the likes of Diego Forlan? We had oh my days. We have some great the strikers. Falcaos and stuff like that. Del Piero, Trezeguet. Who remembers Alvaro Recoba? Wow. Oh, my Lord. 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 You roll back the years. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. We're talking about this in this decade, bro. <laughs> I'm going to roll back the years. Now, let's go back to Recoba, though. He's, he's recent, actually. He played with, like, Christian Vieri's in them, right? Yeah. yeah. That's uh, even a name. So. Vieri, wow. Yeah, see? The Vieri's and Zaggy's, the Van Nistelrooy's. Mm. Oh, you don't have that. We don't have that. No, Roy McKay. Oh my lord! I, <laughs> I will. Take you're, us, you're calling out the relics. You're calling <laughs> out the relics. Taking us, bro. <laughs> now it'll be interesting one day just to have a debate as to which league had the best collection of strikers in history. It'll be interesting. Ooh. A very interesting debate. <laughs> it will be. I think mm. I think I know the answer though, but it will yeah, be. same. I think so as well. Man. <laughs> 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 we'll leave that for another time. Yeah. <laughs> we'll leave that for another day. All right, so let's move on to everyone's favourite section of the podcast, and it's our retro game of the week. So again, we look nice. at a game over the past 10, 15 years, which stood out to us as a classic. And today's retro game of the week is Liverpool versus Chelsea in the 2005 Champions League semi final. But particularly today, we just want to look at the second leg, which finished 1-0 to the Reds and saw them through to their first Euro- European Cup final in 20 years. But the game will always be remembered for Luis Garcia's ghost goal in the fourth minute, which eventually decided a tie. 
and caused endless amount of controversy and debate even until this day. Was it a goal? Was it over, over the line? Guys, what do you think? Uh, this was a classic game. What were your thoughts going back and watching this game? I agree with Mourinho wholeheartedly. Listen, <laughs> when you watch that second leg, yeah, it was an even matched game. A very even match game until that very point. You know, it was a it was a tactical battle between two of arguably the most tactically astute managers in football. Um, um, it was it was an interesting one. It was an interesting one. Yeah, no, it was it was it was a a game you couldn't miss. It was a game you couldn't miss. It was very interesting. It was tight, and that's reflected by the score at the end of the game. Um, both both managers were made a journey to the English the English league, and they found themselves against each other in the semi-final. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Then they, they both had a point to prove, to, to stay, stay a claim in, in their influence in the league and in Europe as well. And I think, I think looking at Liverpool's lineup, I think Benita has done wonders. That's what you call a miracle mm. to have gone through with that team, if I'm honest. Yeah. So all the credit to him, because, because, if if you were to look at the, the achievements of this particular um, Chelsea team, it's not to be messed about with at all. It's not to be messed about with, mm-hmm. and so and so he did he did excellent to to have you know been able to cross the finish line with this team. Guys, do you think the goal it was a goal? Yes or no? <laughs> goal. No chance. No chance. It was a goal. I think it's a goal. Yeah. Goal. Really? Go. Oh, look at Galatasaray's <laughs> position. No chance. Go. Go. <laughs> I say no chance. You're Liverpool. You love Liverpool secretly in your heart. That's why. Listen, it was not a goal. Go. No chance. Go. No the, chance. Gallas, Gallas is um, clearance. Yeah. If you see Sola how his his right foot cleared the ball, it had to go deep into the goal, then come and meet the ball. By no, the time he reached it, no, he had crossed the line. No. Trust me, ball, no, ball over the line. Ball over the line. <laughs> it wasn't, bro. It, I believe some of the ball was over the line, but not the whole ball. Not the whole ball. No chance. Trust me, it was over the line. No yeah. chance. <laughs> <laughs> no, I tend to agree with AJ, but I think um, a point that's sort of been missed in all this um, controversy is that, you know, whether the goal stood or didn't, um, if it didn't stand, the referee surely would have had to send off check um, and then obviously given a penalty to Liverpool because, I mean, there was a clear foul on Barros. So, even if Excellent they point. didn't, even if they didn't score, if it was the goal was ruled out, um, Liverpool had the opportunity to have a penalty and play against ten men for the rest of the tie. So, um, mm. do you think Excellent the referee would have point. set them off? I think that's a red card. Of course, it yeah. was a red card. He didn't win the ball. Think, I don't know if the ref would have set them off. You know, mm-hmm. he, he would have had to. He yeah. would have had to. If he hadn't um, allowed the goal to, to stand, he would have had to send off check and given Liverpool a penalty. I agree. That's a great But the ref didn't actually give the goal. It was a linesman who nodded and said it had gone over the line. I don't think the ref was going to give it anything, guys. Honestly. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, it's good. It's good he, he listened to his linesman because <laughs> I'm sure I'm he wouldn't have left Anfield that day. He wouldn't have no, left but seriously, though, like I was saying before, um, the, game, the game was a very very delicately poised game. Mm. You know, um, I think if we look at the squads, they were even, especially the team lineups. Do you know one thing? I'll, sure? I'll, I'll wanna, let me Let me explain why. Let me explain why. Because Chelsea's lineup was very, very weird. Only because, yeah, they had either Good Johnson playing in a midfield three and then the front three consisted of Joe Cole, who we know isn't going to hug the touchdown and get at the fullback. But then he was so far away from Drogba as it was all game. Thiago in midfield, I don't... I, he, he didn't... He, honestly, I've, I never really rated him as a player. Let me be honest with you. Yeah? Oh, wow. I, I thought he was, he, was, he was average. I thought he was an average player at best. That's personally, guys, isn't it? All you Chelsea fans, don't come and kill me off. You get me? This is a personal <laughs> viewpoint, you know what I mean? But... And I was just very disappointed in the way Mourinho lined up with a team. I, I felt like it was a bit more... A bit more defensive. Look, he had but Brian Robin. AJ, there. just to cut you for a second. So I think the main problem was that Duff was injured and then Robin, he was only coming back from injury. So if those two were playing, you would have had Robin on one side, Duff on one side, Jogwa as well. And I think that was, I think, to be honest, that was the difference in the game. Because I feel like if they, yeah. had, if they had Duff and Robin at their full potential, 
I feel like they would have gone through on that tie. They would have scored at least 100%. Goals, they would have massacred Liverpool. Yeah. Because nice. the, what, when I watch a game, what Chelsea lacked was natural wit. Yeah. And they kept on coming inside into the bodies and they were getting snuffed out. If they had that... When Robin came on, let's watch it. Look yeah. how many times he got the ball out wide. Look how many crosses he put in. Yeah, he was running at players. Know, honestly, if Damien Duff and Ian Robin were 100% getting they something that game, Chelsea would have won that game. Yeah. I would have to disagree. I would have wow. to disagree. Mm. I, I don't wow. Think, I don't think, yeah, those players missing is a good enough excuse for, for Chelsea to have not won that game. Look, I have here a yeah, checking goal. Jeremy, Cavalio, Terry, Gallas at the back, right? You got Makalele, Thiago and Lampard in midfield. You got Cole, Drogba and Good Johnson, yeah? Compare that team to Liverpool, Duda can go. They got Finnan, Carragher, Hippia and Twayore. They got Hammond, Biscan, Luis Garcia, Gerard, Risa and Barosh. Guys, if you're honest with yourself, there's only about one or two players that will get into that Chelsea team. True. There's only one or two True. players that will get into that Chelsea team. Gerard is, Gerard is a given to take over of, um, over from, what is it called? Thiago. Thiago, right? And then you don't see anyone else getting into that team. I'm telling you. Look, because the same year, one thing we forget about that season here, yeah? Liverpool played Chelsea about four or five times. Yeah? Mm. And they beat Liverpool every single time. They beat Liverpool every single time. This is why Mourinho going into the game here yeah, was saying the pressure is on them. Because if you look here, he was confident his team was going to win. That's why you see when the first goal went in here, yeah, I want you to pay close attention when the first goal went in at the two managers. Mourinho was calm, right? Because he knew, look, my team has done this. They were going to do it. And if you look at the team that Mourinho Chelsea had previously beat, they beat, who's it called? I think they beat Barcelona, Bayern Munich, to get to, to get to Liverpool. So he was confident that his team is going to cross the line. And if you turn over the camera and you look also at Rafael Benitez, he was calm, but he was fearful calm. In the sense that he, had, he knows, yeah, Chelsea's been beating him by the odd goal mm. here and there throughout the whole season. And so he wasn't really comfortable, you can see. And so he didn't want to celebrate too much. He wanted to be calm and wait. And of course, the jubilation at the end going into a final is always great. But yeah. honestly, I don't think, I don't think Liverpool, Chelsea's team has had any excuses. Yeah, but see, I feel like when it comes to those kind of games, I feel like the personnel, I mean, it matters a lot, but I feel like the way Benitez knows how to play in Europe, the, a two-legged tie, the way he just set his teams up, just was so geared towards Champions League football. And I feel like on this occasion, over the two legs, I mean, he got it completely spot on. He didn't have the players, but I think that's a great testament to Benitez as a manager look at what he was working yeah. with and he was still able you know Chelsea didn't even score across those two legs I agree I agree. yeah and, and and that's because the two centre-halves <laughs> honestly they handled Didier Drogba very well Didier Drogba was very poor across both legs I uh, must admit and I don't think it was down to him being as poor but I think it was down to how well he was defended and how well Liverpool's shape was you know Benitez was very smart especially down the left-hand side he had Risa in front of Traore Risa was predominantly a left back as well, you know. So it, it was a smart one because he still had Harry Kewell on a bench who later came on. I think Benitez set up the team in the right way to get a result. However, I still believe if Chelsea had their two wingers, they would have absolutely slapped them, honestly. And back to what Coach Stan was saying, Mourinho was right to say that the pressure, the pressure was on Liverpool because they'd beaten them a couple of times. And also Liverpool at home, you know, there's pressure to win at home. Now, nah, but you see, I think that's mind, that's mind games for me because he knows Chelsea, remember, Chelsea had just won the league a week ago. So, I mean, Chelsea yeah, was so, still yeah. the favourite. So, I feel like the pressure the pressure really is on Chelsea, but he's trying no, to... No, do no, it. no, yeah. no, it wasn't. Let me, yeah. let me explain you know why. to you. Let me you say something. Why. Go on, go, go on, on, quick. Go on, coach. No, because what I was going to say, yeah, look, Liverpool had to win this game and the pressure was on them because they were fifth in the Premiership with 58 points. No, but, me. but look at that Liverpool, Liverpool team. team. No one could generally say that years. team had a chance. It don't matter. You know, yeah, you know, yeah. Look, when we judge teams here, we don't sometimes we don't even judge them by the quality of players they have. Sometimes we judge them by their history. And Liverpool mm. is a Champions League team, right? To finish fifth, they weren't going prep um, Champions League. They had to win that. That's why he was saying that. The pressure was them. And let me say something, as well. Yeah? A lot of the time people say Mourinho's playing mind games. Mind games has a pl- uh, has a place in football. And if you can use it to your advantage, by all means, use it. <laughs> by all means, use it. Listen, the pressure was on Liverpool, guys. They're at Anfield, they're at home. They're fifth in the league. They're floundering. You know, 
even Stephen Gerrard. These were the times where there was talk about Gerrard possibly leaving as well. The, you know, they hadn't been to a Champions League, a European final for what, 20 years or something crazy like that? I don't yeah. know. It was a ma- Listen, the, of course the pressure's on you. I, and I'm Chelsea, I'm coming to you, but I've just won the league. So whether or not against a Champions League final is really kind of irrelevant for us because we've actually just won the league. We've cemented ourselves as the best in the league. Do you know what I mean? We're on for the treble. We've already won two things. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? So the pressure 100% was on Benitez and Liverpool. I completely 100%. disagree. I feel like they were the underdogs going into the whole tie itself. No, well, they're I, the underdogs. I feel, no, but I no, feel I like agree, because I Chelsea... That. Because I feel like... Because Chelsea drew nil-nil. I mean, I think the people will be like, well, they should have... I mean, given the fact that they're so far ahead of them in the league, they've won the league, why could it? Why could they only draw nil-nil with a team that's playing with Milan Barris up front? No, look, I agree. I agree with the fact here that Liverpool must have been the underdogs because the whole season reflects that, yeah? It does reflect that. But that is why the pressure was on them. The pressure was on them, look, because they had to be not only the premiership winners here, but this was a team that beat them in another cup final. Okay, this was a team... I'm talking about Chelsea's now. Mm-hmm. This was a team that's only lost one game the whole season. The pressure was definitely on Liverpool. Because Mourinho is trying to say, yeah, we don't have any pressure. We're coming here as champions. We're coming here with with great winning streak. The pressure is really on Liverpool to beat us. You see what I'm saying? But then the only thing I will fault, yeah, I'm going to fault Mourinho about, is no matter what or how well his team is doing, he's always too, like, he picks a team not to go out there to sort of, like, necessarily beat teams, but, but to um, just... I don't know, just keep the, t- the, the game tight, then get a goal. Because coming back here, coming back from Stamford Bridge with a one uh, with a nil-nil draw, to Marino, that's a great result. Mm. You see what I mean? Because all he needed to do was for his Chelsea team to score a goal. And I can imagine looking at this um, Liverpool team, he thought he was going to get a goal. He would have thought that. Yeah. Looking yeah. at the Liverpool team, he would have thought that. And again, you can see how he set his team here. His team was set up to be very narrow. Playing either Good Johnson, like AJ said, yeah, he wasn't going to drift wide. Cole wasn't going to drift wide. So he's got a very defensive team, even Makalele and Thiago, who are quite similar in the sense that they, they stay quite deep. Yeah. Lampard as well gets in the box late, but he's quite a deep player. You see, so he was really relying on Drogba, Cole, and Good Johnson. And this mm. was Drogba's first season and stuff. You see? And then you turn the page, and I'm looking at this team, and I'm thinking, Luis Garcia and Arne Reese on the wing. <laughs> By the way, guys, can I, can I say, I think Luis Garcia is one of the best players to play in the Prem. Wow. No, nah, he was too inconsistent you know for me. He, saw, he scored great right. goals, but he's too inconsistent. You know why? You know why I think he's probably one of the, one of the best players to play in the Prem? One that of the guy, best, bro. Not, okay, not one of the best. Not one of the best all the time. Not one of the best all the time. That's think, a big okay, statement. One, okay, sorry, let me change it. He's one of my most favourite players to play in the Prem. Oh, Maybe fair enough. There you because go. he was just so... You're right, his consistency-wise, he was pants. <laughs> he was pants. <laughs> However, he was so inventive on the ball at times. It was such a joy to watch at times, honestly. Mm. And listen... Yeah, I mean, that's if, true. And, and if, if for all of you who are saying it was a goal, then you've got to put him down as one of the greatest. But if that goal stands... Why? <laughs> Set Liverpool to a final for the first time in 20 years. What? So should I, should I, should I, should I start calling? What's that Liverpool guy that sent Liverpool to the final? Should I start calling him a Premiership great or a Champions Who? League great? Who? What's his name? Um, this Belgian kid that sent Liverpool Origi. to the final. Origi. Origi. Should I start calling Origi? Uh, 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 Origi has done it consistently. You have to. Have to. Yeah. Origi scores big goals in big oh, games. <laughs> oh god. Mm. But what about what is it about Anfield that makes it such a great? home advantage for Liverpool because um, it's not just in this tie but if you look at the ties throughout the years even last year when they came back against Barcelona after being 3-0 down in the first leg what is it about Anfield that makes it such a special stadium? It's just that fan base mate it's just that it's just the spirit that that's of the fans and how they connect to the players and you know I think I mentioned it one time before you know Wenger said when Arsenal moved away from Highbury to Emirates, they left their soul at Highbury. Yeah. And I feel like that's the same with Liverpool. And, you know, old school grounds like Liverpool's ground as well, they have this, just this, there's this aura around it. They're just feeling like the fans feel close to the players and they know how to just make the atmosphere so heavy and so charged. Do you know what I mean? Listen, I always say this, Champions League nights, yeah, whenever I think, when if someone mentions Champions League nights, I always think of Anfield. Mm-hmm. 
I was thinking of Anfield just because of what they've achieved there, the fans, the atmosphere. Look, even when you're at home, you can feel the atmosphere. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's what Anfield is. I don't know. I don't know. I think it's something that they've it, that they, they've they've cultivated so well. It's, yeah, it, it, it almost feels like a like a tradition, like a like a. Um, mm. I don't even know how to explain it, mm-hmm. but I you can feel it if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think the only thing I can compare it to in regards to the English foot, um, league is when Ferguson was at Man United. I mean, even when they were like behind in a tie, when they came back to Old Trafford, they were just absolutely smashed teams. I remember when they smashed yeah. Roma 7-1. So it's something Oof. about English stadiums when it comes to Champions League nights for some reason. Yeah, I think well, it's I just think... belief. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And I also think it's, it's got something to do ge- geographically. Because when you look at like the seat of Liverpool, yeah, mm. honestly, that to them it's a religion that 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 they have to support Liverpool. So when they come there, they are servants. You know what I'm saying? They are church right now. The difference with sort of like the atmosphere when let's say you translate it, because you've mentioned both teams from like let's say Liverpool and Manchester, yeah, and you're right, Champions League nights that place lit up. When you come to like the the London teams and stuff like that, in London you've got a variety of options. Mm-hmm. If you're not Chelsea, you're, you're an Arsenal fan, you're a Tottenham fan. And so some, sometimes these fans here, they're just like fans for convenience sake. Yeah. Whereas Liverpool, if you're a Liverpool fan, you are a Liverpool fan. Mm. You see what I'm saying? You have no other reason to be going to Anfield. So, so it's more, there's, there's something different from that. You see what that's, I'm saying? Yeah that's, a good, yeah, that's a good point. But I'll, the only thing I'll say is that when Arsenal were at Highbury, I mean, those Champions League nights were pretty good because I remember them beating Juventus there them getting through the tie against Real Madrid. So they had some Ooh. great performances in hybrid as well. I feel like... You're right. You're yeah, right. it's an interesting one there. So, so the size of the stadium matters as well. The size yeah. of the stadium. When, when, it's, when you're all like one, because right mm. now you see the big stadium, the, the fans are quite far Scattered, away from the players. Yeah. yeah. But with these little tiny stadiums and that, you all feel like squeezed in and everyone yeah. can feel, like, feel everyone's breath and the passion <laughs> is there. And, it feels like you're on the pitch itself. Yeah, exactly. And and literally credit credit, credit to the fans. Credit mm, to the fans. Yeah, they, they always show up. They always show up. I mean, if you go to a game, you pay money to go to a game, yeah. You might as well. You might yeah, as well go yeah. nuts. You might as well. Mm. It, it, you, you, you become a witness of history like being a messy Barcelona who are three 0 up. That don't True. happen. If you're there, you might as well enjoy it. Exactly. Exactly. Um just go to, yeah, go, okay. go ahead. No, I was going to say, I don't know if you move on to it as well, yeah? <laughs> just, just for a little history lesson. So if you, look at, if you look here at this tie as well, in the final, Liverpool go on to play, to play um, AC Milan. And when, of course, we all know there were 3-0 down and stuff. But one thing we forget as well, yeah, was a player that scored two goals was Hernan Crespo. Mm. And if you remember, Crespo was on loan from Chelsea to AC Milan. So you can imagine as well, yeah? When Liverpool <laughs> were 3-0 down, when mm. was, honestly, all the Chelsea fans were celebrating in London. They were <laughs> celebrating. Because <laughs> oh, they they're like, yes, our own player is going to stop them from winning. Little did they know there was something in history coming. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I, want to, make that point. I want to make that point. Because <laughs> you can just imagine how people be like, oh, Helen Crespo, like if we had Twitter back then, you know, <laughs> could you imagine the scene? So yeah. like, <laughs> wow. Um, just on Chelsea, I mean, they had a great team. They obviously they had won the Premier League going into that match against Liverpool, and they had won it in the subsequent years. Um, I mean, they had the Drogbers, they had the Robins, they had the Lampards, the Duffs. At the back, they had Cavalio, they had Terry, they had um, Check and Goal. I mean, it was made up of such a fantastic team, but. Do we feel they they should have achieved more during that period of time in Europe with those players? I mean, they won it, was it in 2010? Um, obviously under Di Matteo. But I mean, during that period when they had Mourinho at Chelsea, I feel like they had the team there to potentially win it. It's a, it's a point. It's a point. It's, it's, a, it's a good question to ask. It's a good question to pose. But... Honestly, I, I, feel, I feel like they're done very good. Semi-final is not to be underestimated, you know? Mm. And they didn't do worse because the previous year, they, went, they, they, they got out in semi-final as well. And this year, they got to semi-final. And you got to remember, it was like Mourinho's first year of working with this team. You mm-hmm. see what I mean? 
and to get to a semi-final, I, I think they've done really well. And I mean, even that aside as well, yeah, this was a team that was that came against um in the Premiership against the Arsenal Invisible, and they they finished one loss that whole season. You see what I'm mm-hmm. saying? With 95 point. And so if if you look, if you ask me, yeah, I know we covered the Mourinho segment about his Inter Milan days, and we said I I, I think it was myself anyway saying that I thought. So, like, his, his achievement at Real Madrid was excellent. But, in fact, yeah, looking at even this now as well, yeah, I thought this was a great season for him. First time, yeah, in the Premiership against the Arsenal Invincible. This is no joke. Mm. Yeah? And he won against them because... <laughs> nah, I thought he done excellent. And the semi-final, and they won, they won, was it the Cowling Cup or something against Liverpool as well? I yeah, think, I, I think, think it was in the final. Yeah, I think that was at like 07. I think he done really well. I no, I think Mourinho done really well with that Chelsea team. And also, what we got to remember that Chelsea team was that, you know, on paper, you know, it was a good team. It was a very strong team, you know. But we also got to remember, you know, it was, it was a team that needed a little bit more, I think, to dominate in Europe. Mm. I feel like they needed a little bit more. I feel, I feel, I feel like midfield-wise, they needed... If they had Steven Gerrard in their midfield, for example... Like mm-hmm. they would have they would have conquered Europe. But I think with what Mourinho had at his disposal, he built a very good team. And you know, a lot of them players he had there, he basically produced them. Let me be real with you. Because I think he took a lot of them to another level which they didn't think that they could reach. You know. Um and also, you know, let's look let's if we if we actually look at it, he done an amazing job with that Chelsea team, man. Honestly, he really did. He really did. I think what he won two league titles. Um Serious, and for his first season in the Prem to win the Prem as well, come on! Man, yeah. I get. I think Europe around them sides was, was a difficult one to break, to, to understand as well. It was a tough one. I mean, look, I, I, I'll, I'll forever say this: that was not a goal for Luis Garcia. Chelsea would have gone through to the final. They probably would have won it. They probably against against, won it. against AC Milan, yeah, yeah. yeah that would have been an interesting game. Cause, cause I think they would have won it. I think I think it was just in, I think it was just written in the skies for for Liverpool. Liverpool, yeah. Because yeah. that Liverpool team, that Liverpool team shouldn't even been allowed to breathe next to the AC Milan team. <laughs> I'm telling you, been listen. And the you know AC Milan what? AC Milan proved job. that. AC Milan proved that in the first twenty five minutes. They blitzed them. They bro. completely I'm destroyed you, them, man. Annihilation. I was thinking, who is this Carlo Ancelotti? You because he. Listen, this is careful, lad. They no guys. They annihilated them. Oh, Those goals were amazing, game. man. That Kaká through ball, oh boy. I can't, I can I never forget game. that Crespo finish as well. That oh, outside oh, was oh, oh, man. Uh, someone, or someone will tell you, chef kiss. <laughs> that goal, oh, Crespo, oh my day. Nah, 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 nah. Honestly, honestly, it was written in the stars for Liverpool to win that. It's a special grace of God. It must have been. It someone must have was been. praying somewhere in, on a mountainside <laughs> somewhere. Because they're Probably not like so we know. <laughs> they shouldn't have even made it to the quarterfinals, let alone get into the final. And then, when you watch that game, yeah, it defies all logic. It mm. really does. Even when, even when, Alonso's penalty was saved. Hmm. I said, yeah. Then he followed up <laughs> and stuck it in. I said, huh? <laughs> but one thing I want to say, that, you know the Shevchenko penalty? I mean, Shocking. that was terrible. That's one of the worst man, penalties dude. from a big player I've ever seen. I don't think Shocking. he'll ever live that down, man. Nah. Ever. The, honestly, there's like, if I'm honest, there's only three things I constantly, I constantly remember from that game, yeah? It was, mm-hmm. it was Hernan Crespo's goal, Xavi Alonso's penalty miss and score, and yeah. Shevchenko's penalty miss. I thought, yeah. I thought. Those were the three <laughs> main highlights I always remember. I thought Shevchenko yeah. was terrible to have done that. Terrible. I thought it was man. shocking. He had no confidence stepping up to that, which was quite... Because I think he was just Bizarre. so shocked. Yeah, yeah he was just yeah. so shocked. That, that the whole team, team was so had, shocked, does not yeah. it? Yeah. Because they thought they had won. I yeah. would have thought I would have won as well. Same. You just Same. had to see out, yeah, the second half. But boy, <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. It was crazy. That Bro, Man honestly, was to be I would have been shocked sure if I'm in big, big Champions League final. Like, this is the game, this game ultimately says you, us, the two teams in the final are the best teams in the world. Like, hmm. it, and then we're blitzing the team 3 0. Bro, Trust I'll just put that with my weak foot. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, seriously. So I definitely believe they were shell shocked. I believe they were a proper show shot. They didn't know what to, uh, he was definitely show shot. Yeah, but this man, is, this is this was definitely what's his name, Rafael Benitez's greatest achievement. 
Fraser oh, yeah. Team oh, yeah. I, I, you know yeah. I kind of feel sorry for that guy's how his career has turned out, you know. Because after this, mm. he really become like he didn't even become like a manager who managed top teams. I know he had a stint at Inter Milan, yeah. Real Madrid didn't work out for him. It was like he got sacked after a few games or whatever. And now he's he's a manager that's been spoken with like Newcastle and stuff like that. I mean, if Newcastle do get those new owners, yeah, then fair enough, he becomes a top manager as well. But then he became like, you know, money just at any average team and stuff like that. He had he had come from Spain, doing really good with Valencia, done amazing job in Europe wise anyway with Liverpool. In the league, I thought they were terrible. Fifty eight oh, yeah. points is very shocking. That's bad. Mm. But then I don't know his career. I don't know. I feel like I feel like Benitez should have done more with himself, if I'm honest. I feel like mm-hmm. there should be more. We sh- he should be known for and all stuff like this. Because because I think someone made a point in early on is that you know he had he had that that guys to um put a team for Champions League nights. Yeah. <laughs> I look at this Liverpool team. I don't know how they won the Champions League. If I'm honest. Oh, honestly, <laughs> like, bro, no, don't be deep down, but honestly, if we actually deep their team. Like, huh. no disrespect. Any Liverpool fan listening, look, I respect your, you lot's, you know, your tradition. and They'll probably say, the, that, uh, say it themselves anyway. Yeah, exactly. And but that's bro, what's great about it. You had the biggest steady Eddie I've ever seen in football, right back, Steve Finnan. Bro, you had Jamie Carragher. Whoa, 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 sorry, quickly. What are you saying about Finnan? It's the biggest steady Eddie I've ever seen. Listen. Like, <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> no, you just play your team, you know. I'm telling you. Yeah. yeah. Was, they just get the job done. Yeah, no, that's okay. what I'm saying. No, that's what I'm saying. So it yeah, wasn't yeah, no, like no, he no, was, no, no. Yeah, it wasn't like he was a flying right back like Cafu, for example, who done bits up. Do you know what I mean? He was a steady heavy, one his tackles headed like the ball down. Do you know what I mean? And then left back, you had Traore. You know, sometimes he was a, a super mere athlete. Other times he looked like Bambi on ice. He made so and many had, howlers, I remember. Bro, <laughs> listen, man. And, 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 and listen. Imagine for the whole Champions League journey, he was solid. That come on, and he had Jamie <laughs> Carragher and Sammy Hippier. Like, come, bro. That, yeah, they were good defenders, but not you know top class bro, like, in the league that, of Cavalier yeah, you know theory. I, you know, I remember, yeah. I think that was a year where Thierry Henry done a madness against Liverpool and yeah. he had Carragher, he had Carragher <laughs> doing breakouts on the floor in the box. <laughs> and this guy, you guys, you know what I mean? So when I look at it, I'm just like, bruh. Like, hmm. that team should not have been nowhere near the final. But I think even you know, the greatest that, thing about it is that two years, two years down the line, they made it again to the final. Bro. Ah. And Listen, that team had, Steven like, Gerard, Pennant and, yeah. and whatnot, so. Steven Gerrard. Yeah, that's true. Steven, and you know what? Maybe I should save this for another, another time, but I had a massive debate the other day with a few of my friends about Steven Gerrard or Skulls. And... Yeah, maybe we should include it in next week's podcast. But yeah, we can delve into that. <laughs> but I believe Gerard, from the things I took Liverpool to do, arguably the best English midfielder, man. I might not even argue with that. I might not yeah. even argue with that. Yeah, I can't. Honestly, can't but we'll talk about that. We'll talk about it another day because that's <laughs> huge. Yeah, definitely. Um, just, I just want to touch on Chelsea, just Chelsea team for just the last um, few seconds of this section. So uh, how would you compare this team compared to the teams that um, won the league with um, Gusidink, Angelotti, Conte, how would you compare this team to those teams? Hmm. Whoa. Uh, arguably, <laughs> arguably, mm-hmm. the latter Chelsea teams are better. Mm. I agree. I think... I think no, sorry, go I on, finish so, your yeah. talk. Yeah, go on, coach, go on, coach, go on, coach. No, I was going to say, yeah, was it Ancelotti's team that, that just ripped the premiership apart when he had Maluda? They scored like over 100 oh, goals. Ramirez, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, they were winning like 7-0. 7 8-0, yeah, <laughs> man. Boys, baby. Listen, in the premiership, yeah, in my time of watching, obviously, apart from a few teams like Arsenal had or United had, that team was very, very advanced as well, man. Mm. They had everything going for them. I yeah. think even even the team that won the Champions League with them, yeah, their football they played was shocking. But yeah. I think overall the players were better. Ooh. With Ashley Cole and stuff mm-hmm. like that. I feel, I feel the players were better. Like Mata, Drogba, Drogba was... Yeah, I agree, I agree, I, I agree. That, yeah, exactly. The team that also lost in, um, what is it called, in the final against United, United I think was better. Yeah. So, so, in a way, this is what I'm saying. Like, you, Mourinho didn't do a bad thing with this team. Because mm. again, a few of these t- players wouldn't get in. Like, like the team I'm talking about, I won the Champions League, for example. Galas will not take the place of Ashley Cole. 
You see what I'm saying? Jeremy, but, yeah. Jeremy wouldn't have taken the place of Ivanovic. True. <laughs> Thiago, Thiago would definitely not have been playing. And I've, I, I, I don't, you know, I won't, I won't cast a stone at Thiago like AJ did because I could be like, <laughs> he yeah. cast a proper stone, mate. Hey, <laughs> Guys, now come on, man. Are we, are we, are we genuinely sitting there saying that he was better than average? Yeah, man. Listen to me in the prem, to play in the Premiership, man. I think you have to. Huh? I, uh, I can name you hundreds of players who played in the Premiership. Bang up. You know what? I said that, yeah, but then I, a few players dropped in my mind. I was thinking, yeah, I should probably shouldn't say that. But that, <laughs> but that, I mean, yeah, but that team, I mean, if you, if you, I mean, playing at their best with all players available Duff, Robin, Drogba, Makaleli, Lampard, Cavalier, Terry, um, Czech. I mean, that was, I don't know, man. I don't know. No, it was a big player. But can I tell you something? Yeah, you know, you know, Robin, Robin was a youth then. He wasn't even, he yeah. Wasn't even like, he wasn't even all that. Like, Robin, I was surprised that Chelsea even let him go. It made no sense to me. If His hand honest. hadn't receded yet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He hadn't touched that prep. But I was, I was surprised. I think there was a lot going on behind the scenes with him. But yeah. I was surprised to let him go, man. What a player. Oh, oh, oh. And, and Real Madrid you made don't... the same mistake as well. Yeah. yeah. It's crazy. I don't get it. You knew this guy was always going to chop back onto that left foot. But 100%. It doesn't matter you could not stop it, man. You are not stopping it. It doesn't matter who you've gone and consulted. You're not stopping mm. it. It was too <laughs> crazy. What a crazy, though. You saw Robin and you keep Idigo Johnson and that. That's mad. Nonsense. But he missed an absolute sitter, isn't it? Well, not a sitter. At the end of the game, innit? Yeah. At the end of the game, he did. Yeah. He did. He did. Gosh, remember they had Kesman as well. Oh, yeah, he was, a, he was a weird striker, man. Let's, mm. let's not go there. Let's not go there. <laughs> 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 speaking, speaking of bank average players, let's not go there. Let's not go there. <laughs> All <laughs> right, let's let's move on to the last section of our podcast. It's Coach's Corner. So this is where Coach Dan gives his tip of the week. Go ahead. Oh, I appreciate that. So today I was thinking to share a little thing because you know all of us will know a player either in our youth or sometime in our walk, right? And we felt like this guy was too good not to have made it. And I was just doing a few thinking about it and saw like even coaching now as well. And I saw pay in, into this sort of um, expression, yeah? And hopefully it makes sense to you guys. I said, just because you can play football doesn't mean you know how to play football. Mm. I repeat that again. Just because you know how, sorry, just because you can play football doesn't mean you know how to play football. Those are big <laughs> distinctions. Can and how. Be a walker. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, I'm I, I, <laughs> I think I think this guy's got his his um what is it what his satchel filled with stones today. So he, <laughs> <laughs> I'll let I'll let him be the stone tosser today. That's okay, it. okay, okay, okay. I just in the same way we spoke about the Tiago thing. Does anyone disagree? Be a walker. Yeah. I'll leave you, you Arsenal you. fans. Thank I'll, I'll you. leave you Arsenal fans. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I've got no words. I feel if you see me, remember I didn't say anything, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Give me 20k and we're good. In it. Theo, <laughs> Theo, listen, yeah, it's just the truth. And they both agree with me. It's just that like nobody wants to say it. But me, as it's my birthday, I have the cojones to say it. So, bro. Fair enough. I don't have any stones on me today, man. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> You've been tossing enough for us. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right. So, guys, that's the end of today's episode. Make sure you retweet, you like, you comment, you subscribe to our podcast, and tune in again next week where we talk all things football from the UK, Europe, and South America. <laughs>